it may get worse before it gets better. So this is a very relevant and timely topic. Peace, Love, and Liberty is uh, that uh, I've produced uh, for Students for Liberty, the Economics of Freedom, Reintroducing the Ideas of Frederick Bastiat, The Morality of Capitalism. That's proven to be very popular. There are over 30 translations into different languages around the world, followed by After the Welfare State, quite relevant to young Europeans and young Americans as well, with essays by Dear Camilo Falasca from Italy and uh, David Green from the UK and Aristides Hatzis from Greece, Johan Norberg from Sweden. So a strong European focus. Why Liberty, which is mainly writers from Students for Liberty, so that was a great pleasure uh, to edit that book. Uh, and then this most recent one, Peace, Love and Liberty, which is uh, retaking the high moral ground of peace for the classical liberal movement. And that, I think, is a very important element of what we should be accomplishing, is to explain to people clearly why classical liberalism or libertarianism uh, is the peace movement and why we should not allow uh, our dear friends on the left to take that uh, mantle uh, and claim it for themselves. Now, wars don't just happen. I'm going to explore that a little bit further. They're the results of ideas and choices that are made by people. So we can not only work for peace, but we can also change the incentives for war. That is really what is distinctive about liberalism, not merely promoting the, the sentiment of peace, but focusing on the incentives and the institutions. We need to create the institutions to make war less likely and peace more likely. And I'll speak a little bit more fully about that in a moment, and there's a lot about it in the book. We can, in fact, substitute for peace for war. It's not just an idealistic dream. It's very, very realistic. And the theme of this book is hard-headed logical thinking and sound social science, not just uh, sentiment or uh, uh, guitar singing and so on, but really focusing on what makes war more or less likely. So I want to offer some very realistic insights that are contained in the book. The first, very important, wars don't just happen. They aren't like tornadoes or lightning. You hear frequently in descriptions of war claims about so many people died. And we should always remember they didn't just die. They were killed by somebody. Somebody killed those people. That was the result of a set of choices. In the United States, we've seen an increasing degradation of language. Uh, when a police officer shoots somebody, it's now referred to in the media as an officer-involved shooting. And in the description, it says, and then the gun went off. Well, we know it didn't just go off. Guns don't just do that. Someone pulled the trigger and shot another person. So we should focus on exactly what war is. It is the result of ideas and choices. And specifically, it is organized human violence. It is the organization of human activity to visit, to visit death and destruction on other people. I'd like to remind some of our friends who are more technocratically oriented or conservative when they talk about force projection and terms like that, what they're talking about is the uh, infliction or the threat of violence on other people. And we should never ever lose track of that. But the second thing is that there are other victims of war beyond the ones we can normally numerate, and that is freedom itself is one of the great victims of war. We think, here I'm going to focus on some from the American government, uh, global spying, the National Security Administration, uh, spying on virtually everyone in the world, illegally against the United States Constitution, contrary to legislation from the Congress, and even in violation of judicial oversight and orders from the federal judiciary. Completely illegal behavior, all justified because it's somehow necessary for the war on terror. Terror, of course, is not a foreign state. It's not an organization. It's a tactic. 
So it's a recipe for an unending war and therefore an unending assault on our civil liberties and on the rule of law. Similarly, in the US, and there have been equivalents in various European countries, enhanced surveillance procedures, such things as the USA Patriot Act, which stands for uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorists. That spells patriot. And of course, anyone who voted against it, by definition, was not a patriot. Nonetheless, this act was passed by the US Congress in the wake of the 9-11 attacks uh, without being read by the vast bulk of the members of Congress. Only a few members of Congress actually had access to this law and read it before it was passed. We were stampeded into it through the mentality of emergency. Uh, there's a logical syllogism that's used in these cases. It goes as follows. Something must be done. This is something, therefore, this must be done. Uh, there's obviously a serious problem with this kind of syllogism, and we get stampeded into doing things just because it's doing something, regardless of whether it is ethically, uh, legally, or constitutionally authorized, or even wise. And then, of course, one of the greatest assaults on personal liberty, which is military conscription. Uh, most countries, uh, civilized countries, have been phasing this out, which has been a very good thing, but nonetheless it persists, and here in the United States, young men, 19 years of age, are required upon the penalty of a felony conviction to register as the property of the state upon turning 19. This is a reminder that uh, uh, you are fundamentally owned by the state, and it is the war, of course, the threat of war, that. Uh, generates the sense of legitimacy that they can do that. The third point, though, is that if you believe in limited government, you really need to promote peace. And the reason is nothing grows the, the state quite like war. Randolph Bourne, the American journalist in 1916, in the middle of the First World War, put it so neatly, war is the health of the state. The economist, uh, economic historian Robert Higgs, in his work, has shown what is called a ratchet effect, that is to say, during periods of emergency, economic crisis, or war, both of them are important in this regard, the state balloons up. It acquires new powers and new spending authority and new taxes faster than at any other period. At the end of the crisis, it may shrink back a bit, but never to the level it had before the crisis began. So war is one of the great drivers of the growth of state power. This was put very neatly by the uh, English-American writer, Thomas Paine, very important figure in the American Revolution and also in the French Revolution. As he put it, in reviewing the history of the English government, its wars and taxes, an observer not blinded by prejudice nor warped by interest would declare that taxes were not raised to carry on wars, but that wars were raised to carry on taxes. Germans are aware of how long they paid the tax for the maintenance of the German imperial fleet that was uh, uh, created under Bismarck a uh, long, long after there was no longer any German imperial fleet. We frequently get these taxes affixed to us, and once they're stuck to us, like uh, parasitical barnacles, you virtually, it's virtually impossible to get rid of them. Now, the fourth key point is war is not good for the economy or for national greatness. It is destructive. War obviously destroys lives, hopes, families, but also wealth and prosperity. The Keynesians, of course, like to tell us that, no, no, war can get you out of a depression. There's nothing like a good war to get you out of a slump. This is simple nonsense and rubbish. If you want an enjoyable experience, go to youtube.com and type in the following words in the search engine. Paul Krugman, Alien Invasion. And you'll find a very amusing clip from his interview by Fareed Zakaria, along with Kenneth Rogoff from Harvard University, in which Krugman says that the best way to get out of the economic crisis is if there were an alien invasion of the Earth. Because think of all the spending 
that we would have to uh, undertake to build a space fleet or giant ray guns to shoot them down or who knows what. Uh, when you watch it, look at the expression on Professor Kenneth Rogoff's face because it is he's shocked at the utter stupidity being uh, presented by Professor Krugman. Again, Robert Higgs, the economic historian, has shown that certainly in the American case and then also in the European cases, uh, this is not true, that the war did not somehow generate an economic boom, that the economic recovery did not start until peacetime after the war. And indeed, one of the great things that President Truman did in the United States, he did a lot of bad things, but one good thing he did was when the armistice was signed, he picked up the phone and said, cancel the war contracts. Uh, contrary to the advice of the extreme Keynesians, who said, oh no, it'll crash the economy. He did the right thing, and the economy returned to civilian production uh, for actual use and for improving human life rather than creating bombs to blow up a, a, other people. There's a chapter in the book that I think you will especially enjoy by Dr. Emmanuel Martin from France. Uh, Emmanuel has been very helpful also to European Students for Liberty. It is the best explication I have ever read of the ideas of the French economist Jean-Baptiste Say in Say's Law of Markets. Uh, that is frequently misstated, especially by Keynesians, who say it means supply creates its own demand. And the first time I ever heard it from my Keynesian professor of macroeconomics many years ago at university, he explained that it meant that the workers in a Rolls-Royce factory, very expensive automobile, can all purchase a Rolls-Royce, that the supply created the demand for it. But we know that is not true and therefore Say's law is false. I remember even back then when I was very young thinking, who would actually believe that? That's such a crazy, strange view. It's probably not what this professor Say said. So I went to the library and got his books and indeed he does not say that. What he says is that every act of production brings into being something that can be used to exchange for others at some price. And that means it's not bad for me if my neighbor with whom I trade is prospering. It's not bad for French people if Germans become more prosperous or Americans if Canadians become more prosperous or Europeans if the Chinese or the Asians become more prosperous. If you are trading partners, it's actually good for you. It means they can pay more for your stuff. They have more to exchange with you. And he pointed out against those uh, crackpots who argued that if the countryside prospered, it was bad for the city, and if the city prospered, it was bad for the countryside. He said that is not true. The success of one branch of industry promotes that of all the others. And the position of a nation in respect of its neighbors is analogous to the relation of one of its provinces to the others, or of the country to the town. It has an interest in their prosperity being sure to profit by their opulence. That's very important for understanding international relations because it was the classical liberals who understood that prosperity is good for everyone. It's not bad for Norwegians if Swedes become wealthier. We should be happy when other people prosper. First, because it is a sign of bad moral character to wish ill fortune on other people. And secondly, because it's stupid. It's good for us if our neighbors prosper and we trade with them. That is the foundation for international peace and harmony. Now the next point, there's a chapter by Professor Robert McDonald of the United States Military Academy at West Point. And that focuses on the attitudes towards war of the American founders, a key generation of the Enlightenment period, uh, and also their accomplishment in subjecting the military to civilian control, which was a major accomplishment in the history of containing war. It's important to demonstrate to Americans, who some of whom might feel that if you're against war and against the deployment of American military force, maybe you're unpatriotic or anti-American, uh, we wanted to demonstrate that is not the case. That in fact being for peace isn't a, is a perfectly patriotic attitude. George Washington might be considered a long-haired hippie by some, but also considered the father of his country and his views about war were very clear. As he said, 
my first wish is to see this plague to mankind banished from the earth and the sons and daughters of this world employed in more pleasing and innocent amusements than in preparing implements and exercising them for the destruction of the human race. Moreover, James Madison, the original or primary author of the Constitution of the United States, pointed out how dangerous war was to liberty. Of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. All the assaults on the rule of law, on freedom of speech, on private property rights, on freedom of trade, and on and on, are contained in war. He stated in one of his essays on war, that war contains so much folly as well as wickedness, that much is to be hoped from the progress of reason. And if anything is to be hoped, everything ought to be tried. And indeed, that might be consider the motto of the book, the application of reason to the problem of war. Now, the sixth point is violence was once considered the norm in human relationships. It was classical liberals who explicitly rejected it. Heraclitus of Ephesus put it very neatly, war is the father of all and the king of all, and some he shows as gods, others as men, some he makes slaves, others free. What Heraclitus is suggesting here is that the most fundamental institutions of human life of his day, the distinction between the slave and the free, was the result of war. The war somehow shaped the whole of human relationships. It was even celebrated by anti-liberty thinkers. Joseph de Maistre, one of the more loathsome and despicable of the 19th century reactionaries and anti-liberals said that war is the habitual state of mankind, which is to say that human blood must flow without interruption somewhere or other on the globe, and that for every nation peace is only a respite. In other words, there must always be blood, 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 a constant quantity, a quantum, of violence. And if a nation has peace, it's just a short pause until they have war again. Now that, fortunately, has been shown not to be the case. Steven Pinker, the Harvard University psychologist, professor of psychology, who contributed a chapter to the book, has demonstrated this very effectively in his wonderful and challenging book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. But he points out, in addition to all of the data on, why, on how violence has declined, why it has declined. In contrast, the counter-enlightenment, the socialists and the radical reactionaries, as he says, rejected the assumption that violence was a problem to be solved. Struggle and bloodshed are, in their views, inherent in the natural order and cannot be eliminated without draining life of its vitality and subverting the destiny of, of mankind. Pinker's chapter in the book I thought was uh, exceptionally good and he tries to explain what might account for the decline in violence and subject that to the scientific method of testing. Now we know throughout history that there have been various people who have stood up against war, there have been voices for peace, but really the first anti-war movement is from the modern era and it is known as liberalism or in more academic circles classical liberalism or in some countries libertarianism. It was the first that articulated a philosophy of peace and cooperation as a matter of everyday life and as a possibility among nations and established the institutions of peaceful coexistence and this was extremely important. Substituting peace excuse me, substituting trade for plunder so that there would be peace instead of war, bringing about international arbitration rather than uh, conflict among nations on the battlefield. Now there's a key difference between classical liberalism and other ideologies. This was an interesting experience because it was one that I've thought about for many years and I thought maybe I had some uh, original insight, but as usual, when I turned to my great hero, Frederick Bastiat, I found he had articulated it more beautifully, more clearly than I could have hoped to. 
Uh, Bastiat is a, a great hero of mine. Uh, I think I imbibed a lot of his ideas when I was young, and it's been a delight to come back and rediscover them. At the end of his life, in a speech to the youth of France, he distinguished liberalism from the other philosophies, notably socialism, but also the conservatives of his day. And what he found was that the socialists, as he said, have found fundamental antagonisms everywhere. And in this speech is a long list of these antagonisms that they have discovered between property owner and worker, capital and labor, common people and bourgeoisie, agriculture and industry, farmer and city dweller, native born and foreigner, producer, consumer. And they said to sum it all up, between personal liberty and a harmonious social order. This list might fe seem rather familiar to us from a great deal of contemporary uh, postmodern anti-liberalism, which sees the world as structured by strife, by constant uh, conflict in, across all different dimensions of life. Now, you might think, well, who could really be in favor of war? I mean, that's so br brutal and primitive, no one could really favor war. If you were to think that, you would be wrong. In fact, I'd like to introduce you briefly, and I have much more in the book on him, to one of the most influential political thinkers of the last century. His name was Karl Schmidt. He was a very important jurist in Germany, a professor of law, and the author of a, a number of learned treatises that were deeply, deeply influential and are still to this day. Here he is, a photo with his friend, the novelist Ernst Junger, the author of the important uh, World War I story, The Storm of Steel, of the essays on total mobilization, essays on pain, and many, many other novels, uh, and so on. Junger was an officer in the German intelligence, the Wehrmacht in the occupation of Paris. Uh, he was also a Nazi, as was um, Schmidt. The artists, and here we have a picture of Ernst Jünger as an old man, he lived a very long time, uh, were enlisted in the cause of war, the celebration of violence and conflict. I recommend uh, reading The Storm of Steel, his memoirs of his experiences as a stormtrooper. It's really a very well-written book. It's a very powerful book, and it is a celebration of violence. As he put it, I learned from this very four-year schooling in violence that there are ideals in comparison with which the life of an individual and even of a people has no weight. We learned once and for all to stand for a cause and, if necessary, to fall as befitted men. And one of the most shocking things in the book, he says, it is not every generation that is so favored. He is not being ironic. He thought that it was a great benefit to his generation to have experienced World War I. Now, there was another writer uh, whom I greatly admire named Eric Maria Remark, who wrote Im Westen nichts Neues, or as it was translated into English, All Quiet on the Western Front. This presents a very different picture of the war the horror, the brutality, the utter pointlessness and sheer stupidity of the First World War. It was a huge bestseller, as was Ernst Junger's book, uh, but the difference was when Junger was celebrated in the Third Reich, instead Remark was driven out, uh, he had to escape to Switzerland and then to the United States, and his books were burned by the uh, Nazi stormtroopers. His sister, in fact, was beheaded uh, by the Volksgerichtshof, the People's Court, and the horrifying sentence of the judge, who was reported to have stated, Ihr Brüder hat uns erwischt, aber sie werden uns nicht erwischen. Your brother escaped from us, but you will not escape us. The horror of a Nazi violence. But Remark was a classical liberal, and he understood these issues much better. His books were burned. Junger was celebrated and become, became a darling of the European intellectual left uh, after the war because he maintained his hatred of capitalism, of personal freedom, 
and of classical liberalism. Now let's return to Schmidt, though, his, with whom he had a lifelong correspondence of over 50 years. Schmidt's book, The Concept of the Political, is a deeply influential book. He is rarely explicitly quoted because of his service to the Nazis and the horrible things that he did during the Third Reich, promoting the uh, eradication of Jewish thought from German universities and the expulsion of Jews from the university and his active participation in the Third Reich's expansion. Uh, but you find him consistently throughout the footnotes and book after book after book on the far left and the far right, Schmidt, 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 Schmidt. He argues that the specific political distinction can be reduced to that between friend and enemy. The key is that there cannot be friends unless there are enemies. That we, be, we acquire our friendly relationship as members of the same polity only in distinction from other polities, and that is to say uh, fighting collectivities. The enemy he distinguishes from just that neighbor whose dog won't stop barking or some person that you don't like or someone with whom you have some conflict. He's not the private adversary whom one hates. An enemy exists only when, at least potentially, one fighting collectivity of people confronts a similar collectivity. In his book he explicitly attacks liberalism. It's a very intelligent attack and I encourage you to read this book to see what the enemies of liberalism, the opponents of liberalism think because this is a well articulated case. He attacks Franz Oppenheimer, Joseph Schumpeter and others uh, and really goes directly against uh, the ideas of the free society, the, the uh, antithesis of which is what he calls the political society. Now that thinking permeates the collectivism of the left and the right. Slavoj Žižek may be known to uh, many of you. He's uh, possibly the most significant contemporary Marxist thinker uh, in Europe and he celebrates violence. He loves violence and conflict. He uh, had said not too long ago to an interview in the United States that Hitler's problem was he wasn't violent enough. Such a shocking and disturbing thing. He's the sort of circus clown who likes to shock and disturb people. Uh, that the reviewer, the interviewer said, what are you talking about? How can you be serious? He said, ah, you have to know what I mean by violence. This was typical for his mode of philosophy. And he said in, that the Mahatma Gandhi in India was actually more violent uh, than Hitler because he was able to defeat the British Empire. That's what I mean by violence, namely effectiveness. Unfortunately for him, in an interview not too long ago in India, he said that Gandhi's problem was he wasn't violent enough. He should have been more like Hitler. Uh, Zizek apparently had not heard of the internet and did not know that the first interviewer would be able to find his comments in India in the Times of India on the internet. He is a Schmittian, but a leftist Schmittian. And he says a leftist position should insist on the unconditional primacy of the inherent antagonism as constitutive of the political. So all of social life is constituted by antagonism. And we can think of the normal categories we hear from this kind of left-wing discourse between rich and poor, between men and women, black and white, gay and straight, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That all of life is traversed with antagonism and conflict. Interestingly enough, he sets aside the fact that Schmidt actually agreed with him on this because there were internal enemies for Schmidt as well. As a confirmed and vicious anti-Semite, he thought that the Jews were the internal enemy uh, to the German people and they had external enemies as well to vanquish. So he did not view, contrary to Zizek's uh, facile reading, that the enemy was only external. For Schmidt there was also the internal enemy which was in his view the racial, alleged racial antagonism between Germans and Jews. But this thinking, this Schmittian perspective we find traversing the left and the right and interestingly enough, the most extreme nationalists now in 
Russia, such as Alexander Dugin, founder of the Eurasianist movement, are convinced committed Schmittians. And Dugan, not too long ago in a tweet uh, on Twitter, called for genocide against this bastard race, uh, referring to the Ukrainians. Uh, his view is Schmittian through and through. I've had the uh, great displeasure of reading his books. Uh, they're quite shocking, uh, uh, but highly intelligent statements of extreme collectivism, and again, robustly Schmittian in their perspective. Now, we see this need for struggle and for enemies that promotes war and more war uh, consistently uh, around the world. In the United States, the neoconservatives, interestingly enough, also heirs of the Carl Schmitt legacy, and I do discuss this in my last chapter in the book. They promote what they call national greatness, and they have this phrase, national greatness conservatism. Uh, William Crystal and Robert Kagan well-known neoconservatives in America who supported both of the Gulf Wars in Iraq, said a true conservatism of the heart ought to emphasize both personal and national responsibility. Relish the opportunity for national engagement, embrace the possibility of national greatness, and restore a sense of the heroic, which has been sorely lacking from American foreign policy and from American conservatism in recent years. Their perspective is that something like the pursuit of happiness is un-American, despite the fact it's in the American Declaration of Independence. The seventh point is that foreign interventionism doesn't pay. It's a bad deal. Those people who argue that it will somehow be beneficial to society do not understand the modern world at all. In the Middle Ages or before, it was possible to attack another country and fill up your Viking ship with gold and silver and slaves and sail off uh, after having plundered the country. This is not successful in the modern world. You cannot plunder and loot other countries in that fashion. Spanish treasure ships brought back uh, huge amounts of silver from the New World, as they call it, dug by slaves out of the earth. It benefited the Spanish court, although it ruined the Spanish nation through hyperinflation, but it was not, uh, excuse me, but the modern world is not like that. War is a terrible, terrible bargain for everyone. The liberals understood that. They are the original and indeed the only anti-imperialists. Even as Karl Marx was endorsing some of the worst horrors of the British Empire in India, it was the liberals who criticized it. Adam Smith understood this very clearly in the uh, essay in, on the nature and cause, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. He looked at the wars that the British Empire had undergone for its American colonies and pointed out in the last two wars, more than 200 millions have been spent, and a new debt of more than 170 millions has been contracted over and above all that had been expected for the same purpose in foreign wars. And here was the interesting calculation. The interest of this debt alone is not only greater than the whole extraordinary profit, which it ever could be pretended was made by the monopoly of the colony trade, but then the whole value of that trade, or then that whole value of the goods, which at an average have been annually exported to the colonies. So the cost to the taxpayer in merely paying the interest was greater than the value of all the trade done by those merchants who had mercantilistic advantages as a re result of those wars. This was a disaster for the British people. Special interests benefit from empire, but the public does not. The most extensive study of the economics of the British Empire by uh, Lance Davis and Robert Huttenbach demonstrated quite conclusively after an examination of all of the accounts and books that the British as a whole certainly did not benefit economically from the empire. On the other hand, individual investors did. And this is, of course, what public choice can help us to explain. S concentrated interests can benefit from the exploitation of the whole population through the tax policy, making everyone pay the taxes. And they, of course, get the concentrated benefits, uh, whether they are uh, by becoming viceroys of India or getting monopolies on certain trades or being providers to the British Navy or whatever may be the case. They benefit from it, but the vast bulk of the people do not. 
Now, in a modern or contemporary context, we hear it said, well, we need war for oil. The first uh, uh, Gulf War was justified by the United States Secretary of State, James Baker. He said, it's not just a narrow question of the oil flow of oil from Kuwait and Iraq. It is rather about a dictator who, acting alone and unchallenged, could strangle the global economic order, determining by fiat whether we all enter a recession or even the darkness of a depression. So he was arguing he was saving the world economy and the American economy by invading Iraq somehow to make sure that Saddam would keep selling the oil. Of course, Saddam was not stupid. You can't drink oil. He understood that it's no good unless you can sell it. He was eager to sell it. Uh, they didn't understand that. And we uh, undertook a very expensive war, the first Gulf War, allegedly to secure the oil supply. That, in the second Gulf War, was another of the arguments that was made. In a debate with the former director uh, of the CIA, James Woolsey, uh, Dr. William Niskanen, who was at the time chairman of the Cato Institute, recently passed away. He was a distinguished economist, a member of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Reagan, and he, in my opinion, destroyed CIA Director Woolsey. He said, oil is not worth a war. Even setting aside all of the moral considerations, and Bill was a very deeply moral and very religious man, he said, even setting those aside, just looking at the dollars and cents, it's a disaster to go to war for oil. It's a commodity. The price of oil in Japan is the same as the price in Britain. There's no justification for going to war for oil. Now, Professor Pinker in his book, which I also recommend, and we, there's a, a little flavor of it in this book, Peace, Love, and Liberty, points out violence has been declining for long stretches of time. Despite the fact that we turn on the TV news and we see violence in Iraq, we see violence in Ukraine, in other parts of the world, we may be living in the most peaceable era in our species history. And what we need to do is to figure out how that happened. Just as our species has applied its cognitive powers to ward off the scourges of pestilence and famine, so it can apply them to manage the scourge of war. Just a little bit of data to make his case that war has been declining. The rise of democracy has diminished the incidence of wars among democracies. Now, democracies do wage war with non-democracies, but not generally amongst themselves. And as democracy has spread, we've seen more and more countries resolving their differences. We also notice that most of the conflicts in the world are in very poor regions. Economic development and increasing the wages of people and their income, they have more at stake is another means of diminishing violent conflict. In one of the chapters, Professor Eric Gartsky of University of California at San Diego points out the role of trade in diminishing uh, the incidence of war. He looks at a trade in Europe, excuse me, at the violence in Europe and the general downward trend. And since 1950, remarkable increase in per capita GDP if you look at the chart, I hope you can see it on your screens, the average polity score, which measures degree of democratic governance and rule of law and accountability and so on, declines from 1950 on because of decolonization. There were more countries in the world and more of them had lower scores, but then began to recover and has been improving since then. And of course, the remarkable growth in the value of world exports which has coincided with that. Now, wars that have resulted in redistribution of territory have declined dramatically. Uh, if we were to update this chart, there would be a little uh, spike at the end, a small one, which of course would be the uh, invasion and annexation of Crimea uh, by the Russian Federation uh, in this year. And 2008, we could arguably add Abkhazia and Ossetia uh, to Russia as well. Ayn Rand understood that war and statism go hand in hand. She contrasted the traitor and the warrior as fundamental antagonists and made the case very neatly that although people criticize business people and, and capitalists, they are in fact the bringers of peace. Capitalism is a society of traitors for which has been denounced by every would-be gunman who regards trade as selfish and conquest as noble. 
in an interview in the book that I think you might enjoy, I interview a businessman from California. He's one of the world's largest tomato processors. And he put it very neatly. His name is Chris Roofer. When you see other people as customers, it doesn't really occur to you to want to shoot them or hurt them. Trade is such a beautiful alternative to violence and coercion. I think that put the point very neatly. The greatest activists for peace around the world have not been statesmen or even professors of philosophy, but merchants, people who buy and sell tomatoes and automobile parts and things of that sort. That's been understood for a very long time, since ancient times. The voluntary trade creates civilization, peace, and harmony. Homer, in his book, uh, his poem, The Odyssey, describes the case of the Cyclops, very inhospitable. When Odysseus and his men land on the island, uh, the Cyclops attacks them and actually eats the members of the crew, kills them and devours their bodies. And when explaining why that was, why the Cyclops is such a savage, Homer puts it very neatly. For the Cyclops have no ships with crimson prows, no shipwrights there to build them good strong craft that could sail them out to foreign ports of call, as most men risk the seas to trade with other men. The Cyclops is a brutal savage because he does not trade with other people. He sees them as an opportunity for a dinner rather than a mutually beneficial exchange. And so let me conclude then with our plan. And it's just a quotation from Frederick Bastiat, my hero. When he was challenged, what, Monsieur Bastiat, is your plan? He said very neatly, liberty within, peace without. This is the entire plan. And I think that articulates our message very clearly. So, Davey, back over to you, and I'm happy to uh, continue the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, I have already received two questions, but uh, to all the others who attended the webinar, you can ask questions uh, by uh, in in the software. You will see a small question box. If you uh, type a question, uh, it arrives by me, and then I can read it out loud to Tom, who will hopefully have a nice answer to it. Although I have no doubt he has. So the first uh, question, Tom, comes comes from Caroline. And Caroline, uh, it's a very long question. Uh, she asked, peace, love, liberty largely focuses on war, sp specifically why war is not inevitable. War is a form of societally sanctioned violence often committed in the name of liberty. I am wondering if you could talk about other forms of violence that have historically been allowed within societies on a large scale in the name of love, namely intimate partner violence, domestic violence, spousal rape, etc., etc. What do you think needs to change on a worldwide level to ensure that we start viewing these forms of violence as totally evitable and extinct in the way that peace, love and liberty argues that violence of war is evitable and possible to distinguish from society? Well, that's a, a really interesting question. Thank you, Caroline, for posing that. Uh, I would like to recommend you look at Steven Pinker's book, uh, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, because what he talks about in the chapter uh, that's in Peace, Love, and Liberty is applicable to the cases of violence that you um, uh, point to. One thing he points out is that, in fact, violence within marriage, assaults by uh, uh, husbands and wives typically, uh, and by parents on children, have also been falling uh, quite dramatically. And that was what led him to his research agenda. He said not only are uh, deaths in wars declining, but also street violence, uh, randomized murder, uh, violence of husbands against wives and parents against children, rapes, those numbers have been falling around the world as well. And actually, for a rather long time. Now, in his book and in the chapter of Peace, Love, and Liberty, he does address the question, what makes that possible? The rule of law, uh, increasing economic opportunities for women so they are not considered merely an appendage or the property uh, of their husbands-in-law, but they can have their own independent existence, are very, very important in allowing women to have other options so that they don't feel that they're trapped within an abusive relationship. 
So the good news is those kinds of violence are going down as well. In fact, in the book, uh, there are some, uh, in, in Pinker's book, some advertisements that were once popular in magazines that today would be simply shocking in which a woman says, for example, that she should serve a certain brand of coffee so she doesn't get a black eye hit in the face. Her husband will be happy with her. Can you imagine that kind of advertisement today? It's, it's despicable and disgusting. And even I remember in my lifetime uh, the common cultural theme, oh, wait till your father gets home. You'll be in big trouble because he'll take his belt off and beat you savagely. That actually doesn't happen as much anymore. That has been declining quite dramatically. And today if people heard next door that the uh, a man was beating a child as brutally as used to be common 50 years ago, uh, they would probably immediately go and open the door and go inside and say, you have to stop that. We have become much more sensitive to violence. and This is a very good thing as society has become more commercialized, as people have been seen increasingly as individuals, and as we have begun to think more abstractly about human beings as such rather than just members of our family, clan, a tribe, or social order? That's a great question, uh, and indeed the ingredients of domestic peace of that sort are very substantially the same as those for international peace, as Pinker has demonstrated. So thank you for posing that. All right, Tom, I have another question for you from Nick. He asks, would you consider the theory of a just war as defined by, for example, or just Augustine, I'm sorry, or Michael Walzer to be incompatible with the classical liberal tradition? Well, that's, that's a great question. And actually, in uh, one of the chapters uh, of the book, I do address this uh, question quite directly about the role of just war theory. I do think that just war theory is a uh, contributor uh, to the liberal tradition. It is compatible with it because it looked first at the point that war has to be justified rather than just something that you want to do. It has to be a response to some kind of injustice or some kind of threat. So at the very beginning it begins to put some limits. War is not justified under just war theory if it's for glory or, or, or uh, to get uh, women or something like that as often was the case in the past as war bands would wage war to kidnap women for purposes of raping them or to just go take all their cows or, or whatever might be the case. So I think the just war theory is, is a, a significant contributor to the di diminution of war. But let me add another element and that is I think a, a significant feature and it is in the first chapter of the book and that is that I think we should rethink just war theory it has often been posed as somehow saying that if the war is justified, then you are justified in doing anything necessary to win it. And I think that the order of justification is wrong. And I cite the uh, uh, philosopher of war and conflict, Robert Holmes, in the book. Instead, in deciding whether going to war is justified, we should ask whether the things needed to win it are justified. In other words, that the order of justification in most traditional just war theory, and Walzer is an example of this, is backward. And Holmes makes a very strong case that we should first say, if you're going to go to war, you'll have to do those things. Are those things justified? And if not, then the decision to go to war is not justified. To give a very simple example, when I met with members of the Danish parliament, uh, who had uh, military troops in uh, Afghanistan at the time as part of the NATO uh, contingent. And I'd been in Afghanistan uh, five times prior to that and had visited much of the country. And one of the members of parliament said, uh, can we win? Can we win in Denmark? Can we, can we really pacify the country? And I said, well, yes, you can. You can. Here's what you have to do. You have to have Danish and American and Dutch and uh, uh, other troops be willing to round up villagers, to burn down their villages, to concentrate them in uh, uh, settlements that you can control, uh, 
You have to be willing to line up people over ditches and machine gun them. You have to be willing to kill huge numbers of people. And after a hundred years of doing that, you will be able to pacify Afghanistan. But I don't think you're willing to do that. So the answer is, if you want to continue to have the character that you associate with the Danish nation, no, you cannot. It is unwinnable. And I think that's the way that we should think about these issues. So I believe in a more radical approach to the just war theory by returning to the question of is the war justified by asking what would be necessary to undertake it. And if those things are not justified, then the war itself is not justified. So I hope you find that chapter interesting and uh, worthwhile. All right, uh, Tom, we have, a, you, we have a follow-up on that by Sven, and he asks, uh, do you think Jeff uh, McGann's of McMahon's just war theory is an advancement of a liberal approach to war, example given, as it demands respect for individuals, opponents, even during a setting of war, as well as a relective soldier as a moral agent? I didn't quite catch the reference. Could you please repeat it? Uh, do you think Jeff M McMahon, then, I think it is, just war theory is an advancement, advancement of a liberal approach to war? Uh, example given, as it demands respect for individuals or opponents, even during a setting of war, as well as a reflective a soldier as a moral agent. Uh, I'm afraid I, I'm not acquainted with the reference. Maybe I didn't quite catch it correctly. Um, so I can't answer it directly. I can say that I think that the various conventions on war have been also important, partly because they have reflected some understanding and respect for first non-combatants, but also for combatants as well, and that they not be simply massacred or tortured but that there are restraints on the behavior of them. And this has been, of course, in the United States, a great uh, uh, topic of debate and a kind of legal crisis, also in some European countries, because of the extraordinary rendition, as it was called, as people would be kidnapped and then sent to other countries where torture was uh, the, uh, quite common. This is disgusting and unacceptable illegal behavior and it has caused a great deal of moral revulsion in Europe and in the United States. And then similarly, with the behavior of the American government in Guantanamo, some of that behavior was clearly criminal, and it was very important, and I should say libertarians were quite united in this, that the rule of law be maintained and that those kinds of behavior be stopped. This was a authentically shameful, shameful behavior uh, that was undertaken by the United States government for waterboarding, which doesn't kill you, but is a, is a gruesome form of torture, as well as psychological torture. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe the last question uh, from Alfredo, he, ask, uh, he asks that, Bing, does Pinker takes into consideration issues such as the militarization of the police, even if war among states is declining, shouldn't we fear those new type uh, of states inflicted violence? Well, that, that's also just a really important point. There is a chapter in the book uh, specifically on this question, which I commissioned from Radley Balco. Radley is the author of a very important book, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, uh, and he is a columnist now for the Washington Post newspaper in the United States. Uh, his book is wonderful, and I was very happy that I was able to get an essay specifically written for this book on the militarization of policing around the world, because we're seeing the methods of the, the field of combat now being deployed on the streets of cities and domestic policing issues. And instead of being police officers, increasingly they're... Uh, bringing the methods of uh, military conflict into our cities. That's, again, unacceptable. The United States has been one of the leaders in this, in what are called SWAT tactics, special weapons and tactics, SWAT teams, rather. But even in other countries, very notably Russia, 
uh, with their Oman, but even other countries such as Britain uh, and even Canada. I'm a big fan of Canada, which is a generally quite peaceful country, but they've been following in this uh, path as well. I think it's extremely dangerous. Alfredo's question is exactly spot on. Pinker does not deal uh, directly with this, I don't recall, but he does look at general decline in domestic violence. I should point out one quick point. As the police have become more and more and more uh, armed and uh, dangerous, this is actually the safest time, certainly in the United States, to be a police officer. The likelihood of violence has diminished so uh, rapidly. Uh, there's never been a more safe time to be a police officer today. I don't think it's caused by the increasing violence of the police, quite the contrary. This puts them at greater risk. This is not the time to ramp up military deployment domestically. This is the time to return police officers to what they used to be called, which was peace officers. All right. Uh, that is just on time. Uh, so we filled uh, an hour of talk, which is beautiful. Uh, Tom, I want to thank you uh, for giving this presentation, all the attendees, of course, for being here. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, then we have uh, James Lark, who will uh, talk about libertarianism and, and communication. So that will be interesting as well, as he is a very uh, motivated speaker, uh, as you probably all know. Uh, so hopefully I see you there and have a great time. Thank you, Davey. It's a real pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tom.